Welcome to Control Your Career, a podcast to help you conquer uncertainty, shatter imposter syndrome, and rise above the expectations imposed by others. My name is Julia Toothaker, and I am the career coach and strategist at Ride the Tide Collective, my career development company where I offer career coaching courses, and I have a plethora of free content. I have been doing this work for over a decade, and I want to help empower professionals like you to find clarity, navigate your current career with finesse, and propel yourself toward career advancement in alignment with your unique personality, preferences, and values. This podcast is a great place to start your journey toward controlling your career. Season 10 is all about managers and specifically what managers want and expect from their employees and teams. I've brought on people managers with at least 10 years of experience managing who are also currently managers to help you understand their mindset and expectations. Each episode will have action items that you can apply to your unique situation and consider in your relationship with your manager. You can find this episode and more at ridethetidecollective.com. And you can connect with me on LinkedIn, where I post career information and inspiration to help you control your career. Welcome back, everyone. I am so excited for my guest today. And I feel like, again, I'm saying that every time, but I think it's because I actually know my guests on this season. (laughs) And so it's really fun to bring on people that you know, and my guest today is no exception. Tomas Company is the senior product manager and current interim director at Adidas. And he has been at Adidas for a long time. And I'm going to let him talk about his experience there. But before we get into that, I have to give a nod to how we got introduced. And one thing you might notice is we have somewhat of a similar setup in terms of our cameras and all of that different flavor, obviously. But we actually met through Dan Bennett, who does uh, video coaching for entrepreneurs and professionals. And so that is how Tomas and I met. And we just like hit it off during this session. Um, And we have stayed in contact ever since. And when I decided to do managers for this, I knew immediately that I had to have Tomas on as a guest. He was one of the first people that I approached, not only because of his role at Adidas, but also for how he incorporates his own business and coaching that he has learned on the side into what he does as a people manager. So Tomas, I'm so excited that you're here and we get to do this interview finally. (laughs) Thank you so much. And thank you for having me. Uh, It really means a lot. Thank you. Yes. Okay. I want to kick it off and send it over to you to give kind of a rundown of your background and how you got into the people management space. Cool. So my background, I studied international business in Germany and then international management in France. As you can hear, I'm not an American. I was born in Germany with Spanish parents um, and uh, grew up in Germany, lived there most of my life. Um, And during my last semester, I wanted to have a last peek into the corporate world. and applied at Adidas, um, the sporting goods company, and which is headquartered 20 minutes away from where I lived. Got the got the role, got the internship, and uh, yeah, that's it, and never left. So it's like almost 19 years, um, most of it within product marketing. And as I said, I started as an intern, became an assistant product manager, product manager, senior product manager, director, back to senior product manager through uh, yeah, different roles, different teams, um, mostly within that world of product marketing, as I said. And seven years ago, a bit more than seven years ago, I uh, felt like I needed uh, to press the restart button for my life and decided to um, move to the U.S. to our North American headquarters, where I'm working from right now in Portland, Oregon. Awesome. Oh, my gosh. Okay, so 
it's not common these days for people to stay with a company for so long. So I love that we get to have you on and have that perspective because I feel like so many people now are switching companies, especially when they do want to go into the people management role. And I think that at least, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that that speaks to what Adidas has done in terms of employee development and opportunities within the organization. Is that fair to say the opportunities were there and you were able to kind of capitalize on that throughout your career? Yes. So, um, you know, that knowledge comes through experience on the one hand, and then through all the trainings and programs that were offered to me. And the third part, which I also think is extremely important, is mentoring. So mm -hmm. picking the right people that can mentor you and guide you in your career, also within people management, um, helped me a lot to really be who I am today. Yeah. Oh, I love that. Okay. I want to get into talking about your people management style. Because again, having been with one organization, I'm so curious to know this from you. But can you describe your style and then how you have seen that evolve over the years? Yeah. So um, I think a key word would be empathy, uh, because that's one of my core values or strengths. Um, and uh, that really describes me really well. And I believe that empathy is one of the key requirements to manage people. Um, so this is something I had all the time within me because it's part of who I am. But then, as I said, through mentoring, through own experience, experiences through uh, programs and also now through my life coaching it helped me um, see that topic slightly differently and handle it differently while at the beginning when you are junior you are filled with ambition and uh, but also some insecurities right because mm -hmm. you don't know you just try um, <clears throat> versus now um also being a little older, knowing who I am, knowing what I want, knowing what my strengths are. Um, you try to combine what the goals of the company you work for are, um, what is required uh, per employee, what is then acquired by my team and the business uh, I'm in and the business section I'm in. And then and this is the difference. And then I started to focus on what is the expectation of the single employee, mm -hmm. of the individual, and to expectations, wishes, dreams. Uh, and this is what I think made me slightly different to how I was before, when I was very business focused to people focused with business in the background. Mm -hmm. uh, still pursuing, obviously, uh, whatever the business is pursuing um, and defined as goal, but putting more and more focus on the individual. Very good example would be, who are you as a person, right? And this is what I also do in my uh, coaching business. So comes in very handy to then um, describe who are you? What are your strengths? Who do you want to become? And all these questions help that person to figure out many things. Is this the right company for me? Is this the right team for me? Is this the right section and business for me? Um, do I have the right development plan or should I deviate? Do we have to redefine it? Um, what key stakeholders do we need to bring on board to help that person follow the path we defined? So, yeah, there's a lot. I don't know why you want to jump in and, or more details, but I would say this is this is what um, I pay a lot of attention to when um, managing people. Yeah, yeah. OK, so one thing I want to highlight that you said that I don't know that managers or employees think about a lot in this process, which is that transition from being more business focused, right? So you are in your role and you're more um, uh, 
uh, working specifically in your role to the people side, to the management side, and the transition of business goals to people goals in alignment with business goals. <laughs> and I I feel like when we're talking about new managers, I think for some of them, that transition is very difficult because especially if they are a little bit more high achieving, high performing, they're used to hitting their own goals and all of that. And so it's like, okay, go, 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 go. Now you've got a team of people that you have to now influence understanding what the goals are of the organization, but also working within what they have to offer. And I feel like without the right training and without some understanding on both sides, I think that's where we see a lot of manager-employee relationships fail. And so I love that you brought that up, brought that up because I think that's such, it, it's a transition that really just doesn't get discussed in that way. And I love how you talked about it. So I I so appreciate you bringing that up. Um, I think that's going to be helpful for people who want to be managers. But also one of the things I've been trying to get across in this season is as an employee, understanding where your manager is in their management journey, because those first few years are going to look wildly different then five or 10 years down the line, especially whether or not they've had additional training. So yeah, yeah, Yeah. I love that. One thing thing I also want to emphasize is in that transition from becoming very self-focused because you start in a corporation, you might have defined goals in five years, I want to be here. Um, So you're very driven by that ambition of... Mm -hmm. I want to have a strong career. I want to climb up. But then, and I I speak for myself, and that is one element of uh, the success in my career as a people manager. You start realizing, wait a minute, it's not about me. Uh, If I'm a people manager, my success depends on the people I manage. So it's not about how far can I get, how, how do I push this for me, uh, who I need to connect to, et cetera. Et cetera. It's more like, is my team okay? Mm-hmm. Is everybody satisfied? Is everybody clear? Does everybody feel supported and treated fairly? And when people go to the office happy, satisfied with that clarity I mentioned, uh, clear direction and purpose, man, it's like sometimes people are like, oh, this is really good. I'm like, no, 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 no. It's not me. It's a team, right? And you benefit from that as a people manager. And I think uh, it goes without saying your success within corporate, your success in your career depends on your team. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So let's talk about building a team. This is the perfect segue. <laughs> So one of the things that I've been talking to people about is the the resume and the interview process. So when you are hiring somebody, what are some things that you're looking for or not looking for on the resume? And then what are you looking for as somebody's working through the interview process? All right. I think it really depends. Um, it depends on the re- the role I'm hiring. It depends on where my current team is at. It depends on what my targets are and the targets for my team. So there are many, many, many uh, elements here that would influence what I'm looking for. But in general, um, uh, the most important thing is, okay, what's the role itself, right? And um, I'm somebody who's very open to consider candidates that don't have a deep experience in our area. In my field, Mm -hmm. it would be product marketing. At the same time, it depends on the situation. How many people are we down? So do I need somebody somebody who already knows it? Or is the team strong enough? Uh, Is the team experienced enough that I'm willing to consider people that might not 
have an experience in product marketing, but they bring in something else that my team is missing. And that leads me to the next point, the analysis of the team. Um, and because, as I mentioned before, I put so much emphasis into making sure people know who they are, what their strengths are, and doing it also in a team, it's pretty clear what strengths are represented in my team and what gaps do I have. Mm -hmm. Do I somebody? Do I need somebody that's more analytical? Um, do I need somebody that's uh, that has very strong communication skills? And this is something that will guide me towards where to pay attention to when either looking at a resume or during the interview process itself. Okay, I, I want to stop you right there because I think. This is so important for job seekers who might be listening to this, or if you want to make a transition or something like that. So many people on paper are qualified to do a lot of different jobs, right? And they're applying and the resume matches exactly, you know, and there's so much alignment and all of that. And I, I love what you're talking about in terms of the gaps on the team and where the team is in terms of their experience level and all of that, that is something that we do not hear people talking about a lot that I think is one of the key catalysts for why you see people who are very qualified potentially not make it to the interview process or they make it to the interview process and don't necessarily get the position. And mm -hmm. it's, and I've said this a couple of times, it's not that anything has gone wrong in the interview. It's that you're looking for something within this realm, right? Within what your, uh, what your uh, area is to then fill this gap. And so I think some people get really jarred around, I was perfect for this. I don't understand. I checked all the boxes, all of that. Maybe you did check all the boxes, but maybe your communication style was more analytical and they needed somebody that had a little bit more, um, I don't know, something else, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. It, that's the side of hiring that I don't think we get to see as much. And so I, I really, again, I appreciate you bringing up that side of it because so many people get so frustrated with the process. And I think that job seekers think that it's black and white. I apply, I match, I get the job. It's not like that anymore. I think that there was a time when it was, and that's not the time that it is now. People are trying to build cohesive teams. And so they're looking for certain, certain pieces and certain, in some ways, personality traits that come out to make sure that the team stays balance because they know who's on the other side that they're going to have to work with. Correct. Correct. Fully agree. Hey there, Julia here. Is this episode resonating with you? Maybe it's got you questioning how you can better communicate with your manager, team, or just learn more about how to control your career. Well, I've busted into this episode to tell you about my career action coaching. Career coaching is more than job search and resumes. It's also about managing the day-to-day -day situations that come up in your career. This coaching option is perfect for the career management situations that you're dealing with, along with other career-related challenges or goals. This is a flexible coaching option to help tackle specific topics to move forward efficiently and confidently. Not all coaching requires a six month commitment. Career action coaching is three hour long sessions that can be customized to your unique needs. Before committing, let's discuss what you need in my complimentary career coaching clarity call. The link will be in the show notes and the description for this episode. Now let's get back to the show. So let's talk about the interview process. Yeah. So, you know, let's say they get they get through, <laughs> right? They get through the the interview screen and all of that. What does interviewing look like? Like what are you looking for there? Yeah. So, um in terms of format, usually um um I always try to have a one-on-one -on -one and an interview with a panel. Mm -hmm. 
um, I invite people, this person would be working with closely from different areas. So in my case, I'm in product marketing. Our key stakeholders are designers, developers, and then representative of the markets to whom we are basically selling the products to. So they buy it from the global collection mm -hmm. or whatever collection you're working on. So um, <clears throat> that's to the format. Um, back to your question. What was the other part of the question again? Just what are you looking for if when somebody's interviewing? Oh, yeah. Uh, for me, very often, and as a mentor, uh, many people ask me also, so what should I do? And this is the task I got. And what do you think? Um, very often, most or always, sorry, not very often, always, what is key to me is stay authentic. Mm -hmm. Be who you are. Don't play somebody. Now, we do know that an interview is like a sales conversation. I'm trying to sell my strengths, my qualification to somebody else. But that doesn't mean that you cannot be yourself. And I emphasize that so often because as soon as you play to be someone and I hire you, and then you start the position and it turns out you are not this person, then problems occur because then there is a mismatch, right? Um, so for me, the most important advice I always give is, yes, show what you can, show who you are, present yourself the best way you can, but don't forget to be to maintain your personality, who are you really, and sell that. Because if I don't like that, then we're not a good match, right? Um, so th that is something I I really look at to through the questions. Uh, it, are, are the answers consistent? That's how you mm -hmm. can also find out if somebody is being authentic or is playing uh, to be someone. Um, and not in with a bad intention, right? right you are under right. pressure. I totally get it. You're nervous. You're under pressure. Uh, that makes you feel insecure. Um, but nevertheless, that element of uh, staying true to who you are, being authentic is key for me. Yeah. Yeah. And I I hear so many people who, who kind of push back on that and go, what does that mean? What does mm -hmm. it mean to be authentic? <laughs> And as a career coach, that's something that I deal with, right? Um, my clients these days don't need as much interview help because they're farther along in their careers. They're more confident and all of that. But for those of you who maybe are earlier in your career and you're still trying to find your footing in terms of who you are professionally and how do you show up authentically and all of that, I think it's exactly what you said, Tomas. I think it's really about are you speaking to your experience as it happened in a way that makes sense for you, right? So, you know, we have all of these different ways that we can, you know, tell our interview stories and all of that, you know, find one that feels good for you and practice that. Yeah. And I think there there's some voices out there that would say, don't practice because then it sounds rehearsed and all of that. I no. If you are somebody that can speak off the cuff, then great. Then do that if that is how you are most comfortable. But I would say 90% of people or more, <laughs> they need to practice those stories. They need to talk about their experiences more so that they are comfortable and then they can show up as themselves. And it will start, you you will start to use your authentic voice versus the rehearsed voice or the nervous voice, which is generally what tends to come across for people. So that is, that is my PSA on here. Practice your stories. I agree. And that is how you come across more authentically. Yeah. And I think too, there's so, again, so much noise out there. Do this, do that. Don't do this. Don't do that. Don't get caught up in very stock answers because that's what like, as somebody who has also been on the hiring side and then coaching people, a stock answer sounds like a stock answer. 
So you have to make them yeah. your own. It has to be more personalized. Yeah. To you. And and for me, being authentic also means um, a take it with humor. Right. It's okay to make a joke, but only if that feels true to you. Don't force a joke. Right. <laughs> and and also admit weaknesses. And I know this is sounds dangerous to many people. Like. Oh my God, if I tell them I I suck in Excel, right? Taking me as an example. Um, and if I it, and if I admit it, that's something. Well, maybe I'm not looking for an Excel expert, right? So um, but it just shows me that admitting weaknesses or gaps is a sign of strength to me. So if I have a candidate that says, look, I'm really not good at that. I'm like, oh, that's bold. That's brave. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. But very often, many weaknesses can be turned into a strength. Mm -hmm. um, or you just say, look, that's not my strength. That's I, I, I'm not experienced in this area, but I have all of this. And mm -hmm. another advice I give very often is instead of always focusing on oneself, focus also on the benefit your potential line manager has of by hiring you. So um, what is in it for me if I decide to give you the job? How are you helping me? Mm -hmm. You know, so for example, um, I'm very responsible. That means you can put things off your shoulder, dump it on me. You can rely on me. I get things done. You don't have to worry. Well, I'm like, oh, that's exactly what I need, depending again on the situation. But right. focus also on what you bring to the table and who can benefit from that, especially if you're talking to a potential line manager. How can this line manager benefit from everything you bring to the table? Yeah, yeah. I think... Ah, gosh, that's so important. And again, we go into interviews with this, like, I need a job. What can I get out of it? I want to get paid. I want this. I want career growth. I want that. And I and that's fine. That is part of it, right? Mm -hmm. But you have to see it from the manager's side as well. They have to understand the benefit of hiring you. And so I think that's such great advice for people out there who, again, mindset, we've talked about this in some of the other interviews, your mind, or yeah, in some of the other interviews, it's your mindset toward interviewing is so important. And when it yeah. becomes so selfish, then it becomes an issue because as somebody that's doing the interviewing, you can feel it and you can hear it and you can see it. I know if somebody is showing up with a chip on their shoulder, yeah. you can see it almost immediately. And so I think that's such a good reminder. And this is such a good segue, I think, into one of my next questions, which is choosing between two candidates. And we've kind of talked about this a little bit already, <clears throat> but a lot of times what we're seeing, especially if we're in a... a what do we call it? An employer market, which is essentially you're getting a lot of candidates coming at you right now. And so there's a lot to choose from. But once you get down into that interview process, how are you choosing between two candidates that really seem very, very similar in how they show up in the interview? Yeah. As I said, it goes back to what I said in the beginning. Um, if they have the same qualification, similar experience, um, I really then put myself into a team perspective. Who would be the best puzzle piece that fits into that entire puzzle mm -hmm. um, of who would be working the best with design development, as I mentioned before, as key stakeholders in product marketing? Um, that is one one where I really will try to visualize that person um, and, uh, and and help me make that decision. I think that's the person that um, will do it. Obviously, based on everything else is equal, right? Right. Uh, everything I was looking for is there. Then 
I, I move on into the best fit for the team. Awesome. Awesome. All right. Let's move on to everybody tired. Team is here. And we're going through more of the routine of being a people manager. So what do one-on-ones look like for you and how do you conduct them? Okay. So um, at Adidas um, specifically, we are asked to have a monthly touch base with every employee. That is required. Um, and the touch base, the touch bases are supposed to be about the person and their career. So uh, what I do in, in addition to that, I set up weekly check-ins. And these are the moments to really say where you're struggling, what are you working on, where do you need my help, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So I get a download of what that person is working on. And the touch base is then really where the what I mentioned at the beginning, where that life coaching experience comes in very handy to say, what are you struggling with? Right? Mm-hmm. How can I help you? And then you have topics like, oh, I suck in time management or setting priorities. Um, that's one thing, right? That's extinguishing the current fires. And then we focus on longer term construction sites. Where do you want to be later? You know, is it uh, within the same function on a higher role, or do you would li- would you like to move from product marketing into development or uh, a market function, uh, uh, sales, whatever it is, and then really build up um, in those one on ones that plan of okay, what. What, what are the tools we have within the brand available to help you mm. achieve those goals? So, and that could be a training. This could be, uh, let me help you find the right mentor to help you in this area. If you want to get better in presentation, let's, who are you looking up to in, in that area? And then if I know this person, even if I don't, let me let me try to connect and, and see if that's possible to have that person mentor you. Um, things like that. Yeah. Shadowing is another another opportunity that, hey, can this person once once uh, uh, two hours a month sit next to you and just observe uh, how you're doing your job so this person can learn and figure out, is that even interesting for me? Should I pursue um uh, that path or not. So there are many, many different options, but that one-on-one with me is really a check-in where we really go through everything, the tasks, problems, whatever, and then the touch base that is a lot deeper, a lot more personal, always with me in alignment of who you are as a person mm-hmm. to make sure that we're taking the right path. Otherwise, there's a clash. So you, you're pursuing something you think you really like, but then it doesn't make you happy or successful. Right, right. Okay. Uh, for those who have had really terrible managers, this is what a good manager looks like. These are the traits. These are the things that they should be doing. <laughs> and and I say that because some of this for me is combating the narratives around bad people managers because it runs rampant through social media and through conversations with people, we hear all about the the negative. We rarely get to hear about the positive. And I think what I'm hearing through this interview, one, is not only how you show up for your people and really put them first. So, uh, so that's happening, right? But you also have an organization that supports it and expects it. And I think that is something that when we are looking for organizations to work for, and I know Adidas is a big company, it's a big brand, people know it, I I understand that, but they're not the only one that does that. And so I think if you are somebody that does want this type of support, that wants a place that has resources and things, that's what you have to look for in your job search process. We get so hung up on the job title and you know, what is this job rec say and all of that, that I think a lot of people forget to look at the organizations and what do they have and how are they going to support their people? Because if this is the expectation, then you know, bare minimum, you're getting at least one session a month with your manager. You know, hopefully you're getting more, but if you're coming out of somewhere where there's no 
you know, there's no requirement or you have a distant manager or something like that, then this feels like a dream, right? If you want or need that support. So I want to make sure that people are hearing that because I think sometimes when we've had a lot of negative experiences with people managers, it's because we're not in the right environment where it's being supported. So, okay. Now we have to talk about the kind of negative thing, which is PIPs. (laughs) And this is really just the reality of any organization you know, we've talked about kind of if if it's not a good fit, right? If something needs to change, all of that. So I would love to know from your experience, and you've been with an, a single organization for a while, what do PIPs look like? Can somebody get off of one? Like, what is that process and how do you help your people through that? I mean, obviously, um, it requires a lot of feedback up front, right? So, um, I'm not doing that right away if somebody I feel somebody's off. So for me, it for me personally, it also takes a long time to take that very serious step. Mm. Um so once I feel like I have to take that step, then it is very serious. And I I will never do it alone, always with the help of uh, my HR partner. Mm-hmm. Um, because I'm not an expert in every field. Um and I can always get some advice internally also like, oh, why don't you ask this person to do this class, this role, this program? Um, I wouldn't say that only or, or the moment you you are on, you know, nominated for PEP, uh, that you're out. Um, I've seen it that people took it extremely seriously and worked on themselves and really were able to turn it around. Mm -hmm. Um, I've also seen people leave, right? Uh, I think it really depends. Uh, It depends on how collaborative and unbiased your line manager actually is. Mm. How, Mm. how, How good intended is that line manager to really genuinely wanting to help help you get better um it also depends on the infrastructure uh what additional tools are there to help that person and how supportive hr can be and obviously it depends on the employee uh, themselves to really say i do you actually really want it yeah. and uh, yeah but Again, sometimes uh, sometimes it is because it's not a good match. And then we go mm-hmm. back to the beginning of who are you as a person, right? right. Who do you want to be? And is your ca- current career in alignment with that? If mm-hmm. it's not, there is a clash and maybe you're forcing something, either a job or even a company that is not a match for you. Yes. And nobody is forcing you to stay right Right. there are so many other options out there uh, and that's why i emphasize so much it always starts with knowing who you really are and then you know what you really want yeah yeah and i think too when you have a manager that is attentive and that's asking you questions that's seeing you know if you are struggling through something and they're seeing that and they're asking It's not, in most cases, not a defensive thing. Like they're generally trying to figure out and help you get to where you need to be. And again, like I, because of what I do, I hear so much of the negative side. You know, once you're on a PIP, the company's trying to get you out 100%. And it's like, I, unless like I've been in contact with so many HR professionals that I'm like, that's really not the case. And I'm not saying it doesn't happen. I know that it happens. I know there are bad managers. I know there are bad companies. So that's that always is a thing that will happen. But you can't put that on every manager and every company. Some people are legitimately trying to help you. But if you're not willing to receive that help, or you're not hearing it, for whatever reason, you know, we all go through life things and difficulties and whatever, 
then yeah, it's going to be a lot harder to have that growth and to be able to admit like, this isn't a good fit. This isn't a good fit for me. And I'm going to make a little plug for myself because this is the majority of the coaching that I do is with people who are in mid-career who got into a career or into an organization that they likely should have never been in. And so now, and that's very common of the millennial generation. I don't only meet with millennials, but it's very common for millennials to feel that way because of how we were brought up and the expectations and all of that. And so that's a lot of what I see is people going, this company is not a good fit for me. This position is not a good fit. I'm not happy. I'm struggling through it and all of that. And so what we work on, kind of the theme of this, I feel like, is who are you? Who are you at your core? Okay, yes, you might be good at this thing, but if you hate doing that thing, then let's not look at jobs with that thing in us. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. And it seems so <laughs> simple, but we get caught up in, well, I could do that. I could I could work there. I could do that. Or I need a job right now, right? The desperation level. And you end up taking something that is not a good fit and we end up in this cycle. All that to say, yes, like be self-aware of what you're getting into, but recognize that most managers, especially again, the ones that I've interviewed this season, they're not trying to put people on a pip to get rid of them. They've they've been trying to figure it out. And the pip is usually the last resort because mm. something's not working in the communication. Yeah. Trust me, as a line manager, I try to avoid at all costs to work on a path. Uh, and it has cost me sleepless nights before. So it's no fun for a line manager either to, to go through this process. Yeah. So let's let's switch it and talk about growth a little bit, because it sounds like this has been kind of a common theme that you've brought up in how you work with people. Um, And it seems like something that Adidas, and I know I'm saying that not the right way, so don't come for me, you know, don't send me emails about it. But that's how I've said it my entire life. It's be very hard for me to change. (laughs) I hear it all the time. (laughs) But how, how do you keep your people growing? Obviously, Adidas supports that and they have different things in place. But what does that look like? For you and what is your role as the manager versus the employee's role in that growth? Yeah. So my role clearly is giving guidance. I need to understand first what that person really wants. And then I can come up with potential solutions, coachings, which we also do in our touch bases, uh, et cetera, et cetera. The employee needs to do the work. Now, sometimes you feel like, oh, the company or the line manager owes you something. Um, Where I'm like, wait a minute, you really also need to work for it. I'm here. And uh, if I feel you deserved it, you have my support 100%. And I will advocate for you. Um, So that's my role. My role is really to to help assess where do you want to go? Where are you right now? Where is the gap? And here are the things I can offer to you to help you. And that goes from me literally doing coaching sessions in some fields or connecting people to other people that might be helpful and resourceful. Um, it, It really depends case by case. And this is how people then start growing right? Which is learning, changing. Yes. Oh, I love that. Okay. I want to close us out and I always want to provide some action items and some, some actionable advice to our audience. So if you could give current employees any advice to be successful in their positions and with their manager, what would that be? It would be be honest, be authentic, Don't play any games, right? And um, try to have that relationship with your line manager, that professional relationship based on trust, honesty, transparency, and um, ask for help if you need it. 
um, that uh, honesty also goes in, 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 in into areas where look, I did this wrong, or that was my fault. That's okay to admit it, right? If you have the right line manager, you're not going to get punished. Um, so my advice is really that know first who you are, what you really want, and try to have a great collab collaborative relationship to your line manager, because that's the only way how your line manager is willing to and able to support you the best way possible. Yes. Ah, I love that. Okay. Tomas, this has been such a good conversation. I'm definitely going to put uh, your LinkedIn in the blog post for this so that people can connect with you there. But you also do life coaching. So I'd love for you to share a little bit about that and how people can get connected if they're interested in doing that with you. Yeah, th thanks for sharing. Uh, yeah, I do the life coaching based also on the book I wrote behind me, The Three Pillars for Real Success, um, which is based on my own life story. So I have to keep it very short, I went through a very difficult time where I thought I health-wise wouldn't make it. Uh, and doctors um, told me, basically, and I turned it around and made the impossible possible. Um, and that was my wake-up call. And this wake-up call led to finding my purpose of wanting to be other people's wake-up call. Mm -hmm. And this is what I'm trying to do uh, with my coaching business. And uh, people can reach me through social media, um, mostly LinkedIn and Instagram. Um, um, yeah, uh, and that's it. Actually, it's uh, I, I really don't want to make a promotion out of it because uh, that's not the core of the topic. But um, I think that when you put people first in your career, um, you become so much more st successful as a person in your private life, as well as in your professional life. Yes. Oh, that is uh, the perfect mic drop for the end of this episode. And I will put links to all of um, your social media and your book for in the blog post for this episode. But Tomas, thank you so thank much. You. This was thank so great. You. I'm glad we could have you on. Thank you so much. This was a pleasure. I didn't even realize how fast uh, time was flying by. Thank you so much and uh, uh, glad having been part of this. Thank you.